Welcome to Monday, right before Thanksgiving. Catching up, too. Let's get this out to the Twitter sphere. This month is always tough because we have F3 at the beginning of it. And then, like, then it's Thanksgiving, and then it's Black Friday, and then it's a blur. It's almost out. It almost feels empty over here. In fact, it's been like, this place has been haunted the past couple days, Freightways. We showed up uh, <laughs> on Friday, and there were there was some gas leak. It wasn't a big deal, but it got contained. But that was a little hairy. And then today, the internet turned on us. And, like, we have, like, these digital door locks here. And it was down. Wouldn't let us in the building. We did uh, break in, though. We're very innovative over here at Freightways. you got to be innovative in this market. There's a, a very sobering report that our CEO and founder, Craig Fuller, put out over the weekend. It's on FreightWaves.com, and I implore you to go and read the whole thing because I'm not going to be able to cover it all of it here. There are so many bankruptcies on this list, but the title of the article is Layoff and Bankruptcies Pile Up in Logistics Amid Shocking Downturn. And Craig says, FreightWaves Sonar correctly predicted the start of a drop in the freight market in March of 2022. Very contentious at the time. A lot of people tried to say we were wrong, and we were just warning you, don't go out get that equipment. This market is already flooded, and we are seeing that uh, unwind and the impact that it's had on companies. And, you know, we talked a lot about the trucking bloodbath, but the new narrative that we've been talking about is what is happening to brokerages. And it's not just brokerages, ocean carriers, railroads, air cargo carriers, freight forwarders around the world have all been caught up in this. Here is just some of the companies. I'm going to start with some of the newer ones first that are on this list. I'm only going to get to like a dozen. There's probably at least 50 on this list. And there's even more when I get to the bottom and you'll find out why. November 6, a court order liquidated liquidation of Twin Express, a Minnesota trucking company with 76 employees at Freight Waves. The 35-year-old company defaulted on a $19 million loan. October 23rd, after its founder embezzled $25 million to purchase a G550 jet and a $5 million mansion in Texas, Goldman Sachs bound Slink wound down operations and hopes to sell its proprietary technology. October 22nd, Fort Worth-based SEL supply chain solutions shut down. That left 125 employees out of work. Convoy, huge, huge shutdown that happened here. It was valued at $3.8 billion at one point in 2022. They said they hit the perfect storm of a freight recession and overcapitalization. That sunk that company. Now they had to sell their tech to Flexport. October 19, third-generation family-owned trucking company and brokerage certified freight logistics cease operations after 95 years. September 29th, Michigan-based Titan Transportation Services abruptly ceased operations on October 29th. September 25th, 85-year-old India-based trucking logistics company and its affiliates filed for Chapter 11 protection less than nine months after it was acquired by a private equity firm, Transport Acquisitions, as Freightways Haas reported. Founded in 1938, Otwell India-based Elmer Bukta Trucking offered bulk drive-in and pneumatic trucking services. They had 100 drivers, 230 power units. August 7th, remember the big story this summer was yellow. They filed for bankruptcy. They left 30,000 employees out of work. They were a 99-year-old company, but not strong enough for this market. Yet October 7th, the Western Global Airlines, they operated charter jets. They filed for Chapter 11 protection. July 25th, Surge Transportation filed for bankruptcy. They were huge in the freight tech scene. June 16th, you had Tiger Cool Express. They were a reefer and logistics company. They abruptly halted operations amid these financial troubles. And just the other day, Hylion, I've covered Hylion a lot on here. And remember, Thomas Gilly came on the show. We talked to him. We had a great conversation. He said ERX deliveries, the ones that were promised were happening by the end of the year. Then a few days later, the next week, he holds a uh, press conference and he says that we're suspending ERX or, or delaying ERX. And then they've fully canceled ERX now, cut two thirds of their staff, which amounted to 175 employees. And now they are just focusing on that Carno generator. And Kevin Hill recently posted, well, there are more than 10,000 more freight brokers operating today than in December 2019. 25,000 new brokers popped up into existence during this time. Almost two out of three of every one of those brokers have shut down. Once again, go over to FreightWaves.com, read that full article. It really breaks down the scope of what's happening in the freight recession. But I don't want to like 
kill y'all with bad news on a Monday right here. So here's a great story. Our buddy Ryan Lova, also known as Trucking A, he of the dog Cash. Remember, he's selling those air fresheners to help support that dog cause over there. Well, big event happening over the weekend. F1 controversial at first. People were complaining about kicking, kick, getting kicked out of that practice. Take a look at my buddy Ryan. He had some time be between deliveries. Roll the tape. He dropped his truck off, gave Cash to a babysitter, and then he went himself over to Vegas, and he got to catch some of this F1 race. And despite all the negative controversy that was being said by like Vegas influencers online. Turns out it was a great event. Ryan said it was packed. He had an amazing time. He posts, I checked off another bucket list item this trip. F1 in Vegas while resetting the logbook. Life on the road has its perks. Bob Fleming says, that's awesome, Ryan. I got to see the Silver State Road Race in Nevada a number of years ago when I was driving. They closed the highway between London and Hilo and had everything from VW Bugs to a former F1 car all running flat out for 90 miles. Life on the road can present a lot of awesome opportunities when you take time to find what's available. It's not all bad like the media and others like to portray. Well, I'm the media, and I'm not trying to portray it as all bad here. In fact, Ryan says, you're absolutely correct, Bob. Um, I've been fortunate enough to take advantage of some pretty good events over the years on the road. What's the point in seeing the world, North America, if you don't get to experience it? And Ryan lives it up as a truck driver. He was also going to the Stanley Cup playoffs when his team was in there. Hey, we got an awesome show today on today's What the Truck. I'm talking to Gnosis Freight's Jake Hoffman. He tells us about the tech driving container lifecycle management and how it's empowering shippers. Travelers Tim Francis is talking about their risk index report and has some startling revelations about the scope of cybercrime in supply chain. Acme Works' Bill Hale, he shows off how his heavy machinery works. We're going to see the hammer lift, which is a side loader. Super cool. We're going to see how he loads his drayage containers. And um, we're going to see him in action. He'll give us a little uh, a little um, a demo of them at work and tell us about the drayage industry. Uh, Spartan Carrier Group, got my Spartan helmet right here. Carlos Lanes, Marco Solis, and maybe Tim will be on too. They're talking about giving thanks in a down year, how they're beating the market, and uh, their new Good Driver Samaritan Award. Plus, we're going to have How Not to Fry a Turkey, incredible backhoe skills, and when Grand Tree Cranes go wrong, a lot more. So let's tip the band, then we'll get over to Jake. Trucks at Truck It is revolutionizing the trucking brokerage industry. Truck It increases carrier pay while reducing shipping costs. Truck It pays carriers in two days or less. Truck It reduces deadhead and empty miles. Truck It provides paperless BOL, POD, and payment. Ship for less, drive for more with truckit.com. But right now, let's talk to Jake Hoffman, CTO at Gnosis Freight. Hey, Jake. Hey, Darren. How's it going, man? What's up? Where are you coming in from? Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, man. Uh, Long-time listener to the show. I'm a big freight nerd, so I know that we've never met before in person, but I've listened to the show for years now, so glad you know, to be here. I, I think I ran into a, a Gnosis freighter or two when I was over at F3. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We uh, Those are our first. I think. Well, I think we had some, some people come to a Freight Waves event earlier in the year, but this was definitely the biggest showing we've had. Uh, they had a fantastic time. I was actually in Knoxville, so I'm not too far away from you guys, but jealous I couldn't make it over and, and hang out with y'all. Well, there will be other opportunities. We'll be in Atlanta next come springtime, so maybe we'll see you out there. But in the meantime, let's find something out here. For people who are unfamiliar, let's talk to that. I'd say they've never heard the term container lifecycle management. What is that? Sure, yeah, Dinner. So we call it container lifecycle management because it's it's hard to encapsulate everything that we do that our customers do if you just call it visibility, right? You've heard visibility, international visibility for, for years now. And we call it container lifecycle management because it's not just the visibility of where your container is. It's also all the things that are going on around it. So from the time it gets loaded uh, at a factory overseas, if it's an import to the U.S. or vice versa, if it's going somewhere else, um, there's all these uh, other auxiliary processes that happen. Um, so think, you know, the load, the customs clearance, um, is there a freight hold? Is the container actually available? It's all these other things that happen in that the life cycle, you know, the life cycle of the, the container that, that we help our uh, customers manage there. You know, Jake, I used to book ocean freight and uh, most of my job was dealing with exceptions. If everything was just cookie cutter and easy to book, I probably would have been out of, out of a job. It was that was part of the challenge was making sure that those parts were seen fit. As CTO, you have to deal with all of that stuff when you're dealing with container life cycle management. How do you present an accurate picture of what's going on with containers? How, what's the tech driving that? You're right. Yeah. The exception management is the biggest piece for our customers too. Um, and the data behind it is how you surface those exceptions. And so you think a container travels across the world, it's hitting different uh, vessels, it's hitting different ports, terminals. If there's a rail move at the end, if it's moving IPI, then there's that component of it as well. And so what we do at Gnosis is on behalf of our customers, we go get data from the ocean carrier, from the individual terminal, from the rail carrier, from the satellite data, right? That's telling you where the vessel is. 
And it's all getting pumped into our uh, data model. And then we're organizing it and saying, what data do we trust? What's good? Um, you know, it, is the, the date that this discharge date, that it come from the terminal or from the carrier, do we trust it or not? And then when you organize that and you, on behalf of your customer, kind of figure out what the, the truth is, what the, the ground truth is, then you can surface the exceptions you're talking about where we can tell you we have demurrage and detention alarms. You know, demurrage when the container's sitting at the terminal. Um, we can tell you, hey, this container's been there for eight days and your last free day was a couple of days ago and so you owe some money there. And it's easy if you get the data model down to build dashboards and email alerts and things on top of that to manage those exceptions that you were just mentioning. Interesting, interesting. So when I was, I, 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 I've had a lot of experience and I was, I was able and fortunate enough to be on the forwarder side and also work within a shipper on their supply chain side dealing with containers. And one thing I learned in doing that was on the forwarder side, we definitely cared a lot about container ETAs and that kind of thing. But what I learned in the shipper side is like, yeah, you can tell them where the containers, but they really want to know where like a skew is or a specific box, or I was working for Talbot's, a specific dress or, or that kind of thing. How do you serve both sides and get sort of that, I guess, deeper data that the shipper side is looking for? Sure, yeah. So we're we're tracking the container, obviously. Like that's like the piece that we can get data from all these different sources on. But as long there's so many ways we do it, but as long as there's a way that you can join that data with the SKU level, whether it's literally a PO number, like this PO123 is in this container, great. And then there's also ways to figure out, hey, we have 50 of this SKU within this container and 100 of that SKU in another container that's on the same ship. Um, so it's we have the database set up and everything to measure which SKUs are in which container, which purchase order, and those kind of things. And if we do that, you can get a, a packing list from the factory where it's coming from. We can get a data feed from our customer's ERP system. Uh, we can actually use ChatGPT and the, and the cool AI stuff that's out there to read commercial invoices and emails and things to put that data in there. But then you're right, it's like a lot of the shippers don't really care if container ABC is at the terminal. They care about when is this actual SKU going to get to my factory or get to my customers so that I can fulfill the contract that I signed, right? You know, your, your website notes some results that you have done for your customers. One story that your site says is that you saved one business more than $12 million in one year thanks to the company's effort. Tell How did that work? So through some of the things that we talked about a little bit ago, through that exception management, the data cleansing, you know, a lot of our customers are the big importers and exporters, the people that are moving thousands of containers a month. And so when we go and approach these customers and onboard them, their current process is aggregate Excel reports from three different ocean carriers and forwarders and then put it into a single file, sort by the discharge date where it hasn't outgated yet or something, and then identify what might be in demurrage. We're aggregating all that data for them, whether it is from a forwarder or from a different ocean carrier, and then automatically identifying every day what needs to be taken care of. A lot of our customers' jobs were identifying what was wrong and not really so much proactively managing what was wrong. And so if we are able to identify everything that's wrong, that identifying all the exceptions, we let them do their job, which is like, hey, we identified these containers got to be picked up today or else we're going to be cost money. Um, and so we give them the power to then do that on top of that information that we give them. You know, shippers and I mean, truckers and uh, truckers and brokers have their own fight, which is uh, over detention. But when you're dealing with the ocean side, you have another battle that always comes up with shippers and it's demurrage. I mean, this especially came up in 2021 when it was impossible to get containers out. But in my experience, it was it was a lot of times shippers would act shocked by this, you know, oh, the demurrage and the cost and everything. How does visibility help with maintaining that and, and these shippers to even know where their boxes is and, and have a, at least a data trail of where things are so you can, when the conversation of demurrage comes up, you can actually prevent it? Yeah, I mean, it's there's no perfect answer to it. And a lot of what happened the past few years when containers were stuck at terminals, to your point, when shippers have it and they see these exorbitant costs for containers sitting at the terminal is because a lot of times the shipper didn't have anywhere to put anything. You know, if they have a ton of inventory in a warehouse and they're trying, they're making sales and there's this crazy time of the pandemic, they're using the terminal, the ocean terminal or the rail terminal, right? It's either one if it's moving on the rail. Um, they're using that as storage, which the ocean terminal and the rail terminal don't want your container to sit there because they have containers that are coming in and containers that are going out. And so that's why they charge these fees. And so what happens if you don't have control of it and you're not able to identify these costs quickly is it adds up. You know, it's like the first three days might be a couple hundred dollars and then there's a penalty that gets attached to that the, the more and more it goes. And so this the visibility problem of understanding where everything is and just aggregating all that information, maybe we can't take demerge from $500 per container to zero, 
but we can at least give all of our shippers the ability to say, hey, this is what's costing us the most money and to triage what costs the most to save them money immediately. Um, there's there's a bunch of different ways we do that, but just getting all that data in one place, surfacing the insights, and then giving available actions to take care of that emerge problem is at least a great place to start. Interesting. I got a quote for you, and it says, visibility providers can't justify their price to the CFO. The implementation costs are simply too high. What are your thoughts on that? Is this a problem? Yeah, I, th I think uh, I, I reposted, I think Craig said that at, uh, at F3, right? And then I, I reposted it and said, we, we totally agree. And that's something that we've seen um, in working with our customers is whenever, if you go to them and you say, hey, sign up for our visibility platform and our container lifecycle management platform. And then the onboarding is, hey, we need to do EDI integrations with all of your ocean carriers, all of your forwarders and do this. Then it just becomes getting the same data you already had in an Excel sheet. But then in order to get it, you still have to go through this long, tedious, costly onboarding phase. So what we do is we have built all these, uh, I don't know, methods of infrastructure for our team to, we literally get like an email report from a freight forwarder. Uh, we have connections to the ocean carriers already. So as long as we get the container or the bill of lading, then we can track an ocean shipment for them. And so a big value add for us is that speed to value, time to value where we get people up and running in less than 48 hours, as long as they can send us an Excel sheet or send us something and get that in an automated format. We do all the work on our side to put that in our platform. We get all the tracking data and do all the stuff on top of that. How, well, how, do, you, how do you accomplish that? Why do, the other, why do the other ones have so much overhead? Why do they have to put so many charges here and you're able to do it in 48 hours? You know, I, I don't know the, the, the right answer other than we've just done it a bunch. We've seen it so many times and we've, the commonality, the, and, unfortunate, fortunate, whatever of our industry is this always emailing Excel sheets and things back and forth, right? And so we've kind of embraced that, where instead of waiting, you know, two months to do an EDI integration with a certain freight forwarder or something to send us send us the shipping information, we say, hey, can your system send an email? Like you're sending this tracking report every day to your customer, can you just send it to a Gnosis email? And then we've just written code that as soon as that email comes in every day, we rip out the containers and things we need to track for our customer, put all identifiers on it and load it into our system and off we're going. Um, so we've, we've done things like that. You know, it's email for the most part for that. API is always perfect. Uh, flat file through SFTP or one of the FTP, one of those file transfers. We've done all these different methods of integration and we're super quick at those. And that's where our customers are, are usually pretty amazed that we can do it so fast and get that value within a week, right? Very cool. Well, hey, before I let you go and we send people off to Gnosis Freight after the show, how are you preparing the bird this year? Fried or oven? You know, I, I, I watched some funny video about just fire all over houses whenever you drop the turkey in the, in the big uh, cauldron there. So I'm not yeah. sure I'm going to be doing any of the frying. I'm probably going to be put in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, smart move, smart. Well, Jake, how do people connect with yeah. you? How do they learn more about uh, Gnosis and, um, and, and get their visibility up after the holidays? Sure, man. Uh, anybody can add me on LinkedIn. Uh, just Jake Hoffman, Gnosis Freight on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. I love posting and, and doing things on LinkedIn. It's fun. Uh, Twitter, Jake underscore Hoffman 19. Um, and then GnosisFreight.com, our website. You can go fill out a form and we'll get in touch with you pretty quickly after that. Jake, thanks so much. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks, Turner. You too, man. Appreciate it. Take it easy. All right. I think that I might actually have that video. Meanwhile, let's take a look here. This is the dangers of frying your turkey. In fact, uh, this Thanksgiving, Service Master Restore is sharing life-threatening mistakes families should make and steer should not make and steer clear from before frying a turkey this season. They say deep fry indoors. When deep frying a turkey, you should never use a fryer inside or any type of wooden deck or patio that can catch fire. It'll end up like that. Uh, two, cooking or on even ground, always fry your turkey in flat open environments away from trees, buildings, overhangs, and tripping hazards. You don't want to follow head first into the fry bucket. Frying a frozen wet or stuffed turkey. Don't put the stuffing in there in advance. You gotta, I think you gotta thaw these for at least three days. It takes a turkey. Um, leaving the temperature unmonitored, be sure to take the burner off when putting your turkey in or taking it off the fryer and never use ice to cool hot oil. Oil and water don't mix, obviously. Not having the proper tools, wear safety goggles and heavy duty mitts when frying your turkey. By the way, I gotta call out the Farm Bureau right now. Take a look at this chart. They said the average cost for 10 people, and I was at Publix over the weekend, so the average cost for 10 people of a turkey dinner. You got this chart? The average chart was uh, $61.17 for Thanksgiving dinner. $61.17. It cost me like $350 at Publix 
uh, just the other day. So I don't know what they're talking about. Farm Bureau actually says it's down from last year. It's a 4.5% decrease from last year. Chris Thomas has some insight, though. He said Farm Bureau is surveying its members, all who just need cranberry sauce, seasoning, and sugar. The rest of the stuff they can grow on the farm didn't have to purchase it. That explains the costs. They're not. The thing is, too, when you look at how they're breaking this down, they all they have on here is like turkey stuffing mix, some pie crust. They don't have any of the drinks. They don't have any cheese and crackers. Like they got like the worst Thanksgiving imaginable here. And I still don't think you'd be able to get out of Publix for 61 bucks. I don't know. Tim Francis, vice president, enterprise cyber crime lead at Travelers. Tim, do you spend over 61 bucks on Thanksgiving? Oh, way over. Absolutely. I know. Whenever I see those every year, I'm like, I, where could, do they how shop? How can you do it for less? I don't know. I don't know, man. You know, it's been a while since you've been on, and I remember you telling me you were a main black bear, and then I looked up their record, and I was like, ah, maybe I shouldn't bring up their football season. Oh, no, that's all right. But what, what you don't know is while I was a main black bear on my summers, I would spend working for a trucking company, loading freight in and out of trucks and driving some around. So good to connect with you again. Absolutely. Well, it's a good time to connect. There have been some uh, headline worthy hacks that have happened in supply chain recently. I know you have the latest word on what's going on in cyber. You released your annual risk index, and I'm really curious to see what we can learn from it. Yeah, I mean, it, it tells us kind of almost every year we see the same thing. Well, maybe we see an increase, right, which is our customers, whether they be in the freight business or not, but even inside the freight business are really concerned about cyber incidents, how how the technology used and the data they use. And Jake was just talking about all the different ways that you're using data, right? If that gets compromised, the impact to the business is significant. So People are really worried about it. Unfortunately, they should be worried about it. So we see these kinds of things happen all the time inside a supply chain and outside a supply chain. You know, I, I just we just had a report on freight waves. There was a load board. I, I won't name them. There's there was a load board. We're fishing, fishing, super common. Someone does a spoof website. Yeah. They say, hey, you got to enter your data in. It's been hacked. It looks almost exactly like the website, but you have to look at those extensions. You have to be extra cautious. Can you give us an idea, though, what your report is saying about the frequency of this and, and, and which types of attacks are happening? Well, I mean, there's not a company... <sighs> Uh, it, it, they're not an industry that's not getting af affected and we see companies impacted every day, right? Not every company every day, but but every day there's somebody that's being impacted and usually on most days it's more than one. And it's a variety of different things. It's exactly that kind of thing you talked about. It's phishing, social engineering, right? And it's, and, and more importantly on the, or frequently on the social engineering, it's not necessarily company A that's getting compromised, it's company B that's getting compromised and now, the threat actors will reach back out to company A and they know something about when an invoice is due, how much is due. So they're really able to make a really sophisticated play to get business, uh, to get money, to get data. Um, so we see that a lot. And we see ransomware. Um, ransomware really is affecting transportation companies in a lot of ways because it's not that they're hacking into trucks and things like that, right? That can happen. But what we're seeing is they're hacking to the systems they deploy ransomware, and then all of a sudden, you don't have any of your data. You don't know where any of your freight is. You don't know where any of the trucks are, and you can't move things from A to B. And it's, you know, live in that world for a while or unfortunately pay a ransom. Neither one is great, uh, but we see that kind of thing happen all the time. You know, I've been, um, I, I know people who have been hacked before. I personally have been hacked before. And you always get this sort of existential dread that your your data is now out there and they have access to something and maybe they've even put a back door in. But like, what are the consequences that you see for actual companies who are exposed to this risk and expose their partners to it? Well, I mean, these are, you know, it, in the best of circumstances, it's a really, really bad day. Right. And and everybody's anxious and the work isn't getting done and the stuff isn't getting to where it needs to be. And you're losing money. Like that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenarios, you can see companies go out of business. Right. You were talking with Jake and before in your intro about some of the margins that the transportation companies are operating under. Right. That's when everything's kind of sort of going the way it should. Now, imagine that your computers are all locked up and you don't know where stuff is. You can't pay the people that you're supposed to pay. You don't know how much to pay them. Right. That, that can actually take a company that's operating on a thin margin and put it out of business. Right. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, just what you were saying, too, is, you know, maybe the threat actors are in there, your system. Maybe you identify that they were in the system, but then you got to figure out, well, how do we keep the next guy from getting in? And are the 
bad guys still in the system. There's a it, this is really complicated stuff, and you need access to the professionals that live and breathe that every day to figure out how to combat it, how to deal with it, how to prevent it from happening again. So what what advice do you have? How do the and prevention is always better than trying to fix the problem after it's happened. So what suggestion do you have to brokers, carriers, our listeners with this growing problem? And if you look at charts on it, yeah, it's, gro- it's growing massively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, well, I, I just some basic stuff or what, what I think is basic stuff is uh, making sure that you're using updated systems, not right? what we would call end of life systems. Right. So if you're using system software that's no longer supported by the manufacturer, that's a bad idea because if it develops a vulnerability, they're not going to be able to throw a patch at it, right? Number one. Number two, use what we have, you know, multi-factor authentication, right? So when two systems are connecting or people are connecting to a system, that it's not just password and um, uh, username and password, that there's a more sophisticated connection. That's probably the number one thing that we see compromised where multi-factor or MFA uh, isn't being used. Um, make sure you update your passwords regularly, right? Basic stuff doesn't cost much. Make sure you're, any employee that's got access to sensitive data and has a password in the first place is updating it. And it's not, you know, password one, two, three, that it's more sophisticated than that. And have an incident response plan. We, we should be operating in a world where, unfortunately, we should do everything we can to prevent these things but have a plan that assumes that you're not going to prevent everything and you may wake up and have a bad day. And what are you going to do about that if it happens? And does everybody that's on the team need to know what their role is going to be and be able to execute on that role? Is, is like a cyber audit, something you should be doing frequently, like to test these, uh, these readiness practices to make sure they're implemented. Yeah. I mean, at least annually and maybe more often than that, uh, quarterly, Right, depending on how big the company is and who does what, and and you've got a lot of listeners that are kind of probably in different ends of that spectrum, right? But annually, for sure, uh, make sure that the plane, you know, people leave their people leave get different roles, and so you're just you know updating contact information. I mean, we see sometimes even basic stuff. It's almost go old school on some of this, where you have an incident response plan with everybody's phone number and email, and that lives on the computer, and then your computers are locked up. And you don't even know how to call anybody because you don't really know that guy's phone number because you don't you don't ever actually plug in the numbers. You just you just hit it. Right. So basic stuff like printing out some of that stuff so that it doesn't all live in a computer in one spot that maybe you wouldn't think of. Um, And just thinking about, okay, if the systems are down, what are we going to do? Who's going to do it? And how are we all going to communicate? And practicing that plan uh, is super important. Tim, uh, lots to think about, lots to think about, especially as we head into the holidays. Anything to leave us with? And where should people go to if you've gotten them concerned about cyber? And they, they should be. Even if they're doing the right things, you should always be concerned. It's a growing issue. Where should they go to get more information and see if, well, hey, they need one of those audits? Sure. And, and one of the things, too, just, just real quick, right? I represent just one part of the ecosystem. I, I represent an insurer. We insure people for these things happening to them. And so... Uh, for those companies that don't have cyber insurance, I would encourage them to reach out to an agent, to a broker to get cyber insurance. Because, again, you can do all of the right things. And we see lots of companies that have the right security still get compromised. And the insurance provider can be there not only to provide the financial backstop, but to connect you to the experts that are going to take care of this. Forensic providers. I mean, even if, you know, unfortunately, as distasteful it is, if you have to pay a ransom to a threat actor and you got to do that with a Bitcoin transaction, we have the people that can facilitate those transactions. So look on uh, certainly travelers.com, uh, but reach out to ag- your insurance agents and brokers. And if you're not sure exactly if cyber insurance is right for you, um, start asking about it and start thinking about how that might work for your organization. Yeah, the, the last thing you want to hear is your CTO come to you for approval for a Bitcoin transaction to pay a ransom. Prevention's the best and, uh, and protect yourself. It's rough out there. Tim, thank you so much for stopping by. Hey, anytime. Let's not, let's not leave it so long for, till the next one. I know. Thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Take All care. Right. All right, everybody, let's tip the band. Truxit is revolutionizing the trucking brokerage industry. Truxit increases carrier pay while reducing shipping costs. Truxit-based carriers in two days or less. Truxit reduces deadhead and empty miles. Truxit provides uh, paperless BOL, POD, and payment. Ship for less, drive for more with Truxit.com. Elsewhere.
that was a grain hauler. I think that it ended up hitting a, uh, a cell guide on the way out. Either way, it's when gantry cranes go wrong. And it was just a cover so I could put my Spartan helmet on. Because Carlos Lanes is here, and so is Tim Perkins from uh, Spartan Carrier Group. And, you know, I should have worn my contacts today because I, I didn't realize until I put this on, like, it's really hard to wear glasses with the Spartan helmet. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see both of you. I, I, it was good to see you guys at F3. Did you have a good time? We had a blast. Yeah, yeah. You know, seeing you guys in, in that aquarium, it's right there in Chattanooga, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun for sure. You know, when I when I bumped into you, Carlos, I was like, man, you know, we haven't talked in a, in a hot minute. What's good over at um, What's good over at Spartan? And then you're you're kind of listing off some stuff. You're talking about automotive, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just book you on the show, and we'll get it out there. So tell me the good news. We've had so much bad news, but you had some good news at F3. Well, it's funny. The economy is right now in the crapper. As everybody can tell, it's very difficult. Freight's at an all-time low, but we've been blessed. Uh, I'll tell you, um, it's, it's been miraculous for us. We've been able to purchase trucks when nobody else is buying them. We've been able to add trailers when nobody else is leasing them. We've been able to take on more business. A lot of the stuff's in the automotive sector. Uh, so Toyota was one of the accounts that we landed. We're one of 12 carriers that support them, and we've been able to... Uh, join at least four manufacturing facilities that support them. Uh, our Mexico business is booming. So nearshoring is a very real thing. There's a lot of people that are starting to move into that, but we were there already. Uh, it was part of our strategic imperative to create a, a relay network that would help us to be able to move uh, transit and all kinds of freight in and out of Mexico into the United States. So I'll tell you what's, what's happened is we've gone from zero dollars, almost $115 million in, in uh, organic, dedicated, asset-based business. It's contract carriage. And in the midst of this economy, it's a miracle in itself. Our, our business has expanded, and uh, I couldn't be happier. I think, I think the secret to our success is our team and the collaboration that we've been able to develop in the midst of that. We've got a Christ-centered organization, and everybody seems to be swimming in the exact same direction. Uh, so even in the midst of all the turmoil, uh, we're, we're leading from the front. Did you guys, uh, when you moved, you moved some auto, did you guys get caught up in that UAW strike at all? Did you see that impact any uh, freight or were you not moving in those lanes? Oh, it, it actually, it, it was a benefit to us. It, it sounds terrible, right? But it was a benefit because to Toyota is one of the, the, the main providers of automobiles, it's the largest manufacturer in the world. So when GM and Ford really did feel the pain on that, uh, our freight didn't slow down at all. If anything, I believe that due to that impact, right, the strike, it's going to have secondary and tertiary issues where it's going to create supply chain disruptions and, and you're not going to be able to receive parts or get components that you really need. So I think it's going to hurt sales overall, but Toyota sales are going to boom because of that. Interesting. Interesting. I got a Honda recently, so I know I helped their sales out a little bit. Tim, good to see you again. It's, it's been a minute. It was really nice to see you over in Chattanooga. You're one of the, uh, one of the most in shape guys in freight. I don't know if people seen you in person, but if you don't like squeeze his muscle, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to squeeze your muscle. You got to, uh, but I got to ask you, what are you thankful for this year? Let's inspire some people a little bit. I don't want to be a totally depressing segment. You guys are full of good news. Yeah, you know, we're thankful, obviously, just for the opportunity to the growth that we've had. It's been um, awesome with this team. You know, I look at the data out there that, you know, 1,500 brokerages have closed this year, 31,000 trucking companies and, and just the M&A, all this merger and acquisition. And so that there's a lot of good opportunities out there for companies looking to expand through M&A. Um, I think their EBITDA now is almost to 4.55 from seven and a half last year. And so... When I look at just being thankful for opportunities, there's always a way to take something that's negative and turn it into a positive and being thankful that you have another day to, to be alive, to, to see this uh, industry from the, the peaks of, of COVID and all the way to now. It just gives us the ability to learn and adjust and maneuver and um, come up with different strategies using technology and um, just different resources. So definitely thankful to have a team that is flexible, a leader like Carlos that um, can kind of see a lot of things coming before it impacts us. And so uh, just tons of things to be thankful for. Carlos, let me ask you the same thing, man. And, and also, do you think you can buy a Thanksgiving dinner for six for 10 people for $61.05 like the Farm Bureau says? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's fake news, brother. That's fake news. <laughs> That's the fakest economic news I've ever heard is that that chart right there. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's all politics, man. Yeah. 
And if, if you really look to the life in, in, in the world, you know, at, at, at a super high level, right? Super high level. You got global freight that has reduced significantly, right? China is decreasing its sales. It's decreasing its production. You can tell if you look at Maersk, Maersk is laying off 10,000 people globally, right? That's all freight that normally would have come into the United States, and it's not coming there. And if you don't believe that, then look at rail. Rail is also down. Productivity is down significantly. And we've been blessed because we happen to be in the automotive space. A lot of people don't know that in order for you to manufacture a vehicle, you have to go in and out of Mexico and Canada at least six times. So that kind of freight is consistent. It's usually very uh, uh, concentrated. But outside of that, it's all fake news, brother. You can tell where the economy is at by how much product is actually being transported. If the economy was booming in any which way, shape, or form, we wouldn't have so many trucking companies going up, uh, belly up right now. You know, we hear some auto dealers, uh, especially I, I follow your used car guy on Twitter, and he's always posting information about what's going on in car sales and new car sales. And with interest rates, we've been hearing that a lot of vehicles are sitting. Is that is that sort of a threat to what you guys do? Or have you seen any of that? It, it, that that's a very real threat. And then he's not he's not wrong. What we've done to kind of uh, curtail that from happening is we've invested in different types of manufacturing facilities. For example, when the economy is hurting, most people aren't going to go out there and buy an eighty-five or ninety thousand dollar vehicle, right? So, uh, we we do support the manufacturing plant in Texas where they produce all the Sequoias and all the Tundras in North America. That's a higher end vehicle, um, but we also support Mississippi, and the plant in Mississippi manufactures all the Corollas in North America. So, when the economy does start to kick off like that and sales do go down, there there are a lower price point vehicle that we concentrate our efforts in, and that kind of curtails the effects of this. He's not wrong. That does happen. But if all I had was high-end vehicles and that's all I was uh, uh, supporting, then when those volumes would go down, I'd be significantly impacted. I think we position ourselves strategically in a way where we can absorb the impact of the market and still uh, survive. Maybe maybe higher-end vehicle sales go down, the lower vehicle sales go up. Tim, what's your message to the reps out there that are that are super down there? You know, they get in their head, they poison it that they can't build relationships right now. They can't get any freight. There's too many carriers. They're a dime a dozen and they, they're just feeling hopeless because you, you keep carrying the torch. Yeah, right now it's a unique time for business development because in, in business development, you already hear no more than you hear yes. And so and then you have a market like this where you have. Uh, expectations to still perform and produce. And that's where you have to start building relationships. I know it's hard to, to think of relationships without the transaction, but it really is real. I think shippers understand what we're going through. And so I think in business development, now is the best time to get creative. It's to understand pipelines. It's to understand forecasting. Um, and I think uh, really getting to know your, your shippers, really getting to know your customers, um, not just about freight and their business, um, but actually get to know them. People buy from who they like. So you have to be likable. And no one likes a pushy salesperson desperate for freight. And so I think just keeping your, uh, your perspective on the relationship is going to get you a long ways. Carlos, I saw a cool post by you, and it had to do with your Good Samaritan Award honoring a truck driver. Tell me about this. How did this all come about? So my, my wife, unfortunately, isn't on the call right now. She actually manages all the branding. And uh, she came up with this idea because she's heavy into ministry. My wife's been to Africa to, to hand out Bibles. She's been a missionary for, for a very long time. And she came up with the idea. I'd like to take credit, but she's the one that found it. She said, you know what, Carlos, let's do something special that, that, that centers on our Christ-centered values. And she came up with the Good Samaritan Award. Now, the story behind this is James Boykin is our driver, fantastic driver. He was going down the road, and a young lady spun out of control. She had a blowout, and she, she did a 360. Now, he's traveling about 65, 70 miles per hour, and at that speed, with an 80,000-pound truck, it takes a lot of time to, to be able to slow down. Now, he's a man of faith also, and he, he recalls saying, look, Lord, help me. And he stops this truck from smashing right into her, and he would have broadsided her on, on the driver's area. So she, she would not be here today if it wasn't for him retaining control of that truck. That's not where it ends. Not only did he save her life, and he told me he saw the whites of her eyes as he stopped this truck. He thought for sure she's going to die. Um, he, he, he gets control of the vehicle. She pulls over to the side, and then he gets out of his truck, and he goes out there and helps this young lady who was in, in almost shock calm down. He prays with her. Then he changes a tire for her, 
And then he gets in his truck, finishes his load, still on time, still delivering quality service, and all, all uh, uh, in, in a calm demeanor. It, it was very much, uh, uh, it was spiritual, brother. And wow, wow. I got to give a little, I got to do a little cowbell for that driver. That was awesome. Has he got, have you given him a, have you given him one of these Spartan helmets yet? He sounds like he deserves it. We did him one better. We got him a Spartan helmet. We gave him his jersey and we got him a brand new truck. And his truck is tricked out. It's got flames all over it. It's got Spartan flames on it. It's pretty cool. He, he's got one of two trucks in the whole U.S. that look that way. I love that story. I love that story. That is so awesome. Um, Tim, before I let you guys go, you got any great Thanksgiving plans? And, uh, and you got any message for the freight community out there? Uh, no plans. Just, uh, you know, family coming over in town. And so it is my birthday, actually, November 26th. We actually share oh. the same birthday, Carlos and I. And so uh, we'll get turkeys and birthday cake coming. So, um, no. And then, you know, the one thing I would say is, is, these companies, you have to still take care of your drivers. You know, there was some poor decisions, in my opinion, when COVID hit and people's first thought was let go of the drivers. And you think that you're going to get their loyalty when the market picks back up. It's not going to happen. Your drivers are the heartbeat of this country. They deserve to be first fed um, and uh, retained. So just keep that in mind when you start looking at making cuts and you look at your driver. Um not only do they have a family, they truly are the backbone of our nation. And so uh, just keep that in mind, uh, everybody out there. That is a, that's a great message. I'll throw a little cab on that, a little happy birthday for both of you, gentlemen. And Carlos, you leave us with some. You're like the king of philosophy on LinkedIn. Well, I'll give you a business case. Right now, what is king is cost reduction, cost control. Not in labor, but cost control as a whole. So the reason why... People are competing so bad right now is because of costs. If you've lied about your, your uh, earnings or if you've lied about your sins, uh, in this economy right now, you have to be able to mitigate those costs. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're going to be out. There's a lot of guys not making a cut. From a philosophical perspective, keep your chin up. That's all you can keep do. Keep your chin up. Amen. Amen. I'll put an amen on that one. Well, buddies, how do the people reach out to you? I know people are going to want to talk to you after this. Uh, we have a, yeah, they can. a big following. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn is obviously probably our, our number one way, Carlos and uh, myself and Spartan Carrier Group. Um, we do have SpartanCarrierGroup.com. That's easy. But um, Carlos and I and, and our brand is really uh, heavy on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best way to get in touch with us and uh, connect. Very, very cool. Carlos, thank you so much for your time today. Tim, thank you so much for your time. Both of you have an amazing Thanksgiving. You too, sir. See you guys. And great birthdays, too. I wonder how that. If, I wonder if that's how Tim got hired. They like very related on that. Craig Fuller and I, our birthdays are like ten days apart. That was a easy icebreaker. I started out with him. We're going to talk about a really cool hammer machine in just a second here. But I want to show you the coolest video of a black hoe I've ever seen in action. Take a look at this. I didn't even know you could do this with one of these. Like I know people have gotten onto flatbeds and stuff to to get the backhoe on there, but this guy is going straight into this drainage ditch. He's coming up from the high ledge. He's using the front loader to inch himself in. He's got the back loader there. This whole video is like eight minutes long. It's on uh, my social media if you want to see the whole thing. It's absolutely mesmerizing. But um, the skill on display here is insane. Tim Hingham says, I have to say, this is brilliant. Creativity at its finest. And <laughs> not an OSHA violation ever mentioned to stifle said creativity. Yeah, I do not believe this is taking place in the United States. However, there is some ingenuity on display here. Cody Cartwright said, this is oddly satisfying. I have to agree. I like, how did he even know he could do this? I want to try that. Maybe not. I, that could go wrong really easily if you look at this. And here's him getting out, too. And this is a whole process. You realize, like, I sped this up like eight speed, but this is a whole process. It takes pen patience. There's nothing fast about him inching himself up. Amy Wells says, that's some serious skill there. I can only imagine how bad that smelled, though. Robert Ross said, my grandmother did that once with her eyes closed. All right, I made that up. D Dave Stuvantis says, definitely some dope skills there. Steve Rainwater I feel like he knew how he was going in, but getting out took more trial and error. Amazing, fun to watch. Dominic Tulo, people who do this are such badasses. I got to agree. That's freaking amazing. And Trevor says, yep, that's how we used to load a backhoe onto a flatbed without a ramp. Jane Zhang, if this guy runs SpaceX, no chance it would fail. 
I don't know. Can you do that, Elon? We'll have to see. Wes Harmon, that's going to have to be a big no for me, dog. He's a truck driver. He doesn't want to attempt that move. The Doge Phoenix says, yep, these things can absolutely hold up their own weight. And then some, I've done this a few times, with more sketchy farm equipment. <laughs> don't tell OSHA. And man, Minnesota Rick says, reminds me that I need to clean out my gutters before the big freeze sets in. Very cool. Let's talk about more heavy machines, though, with Bill Hall, managing member over at Acme Works. And uh, you're dressed the part today, Bill. Yeah, yeah, Tim. Thank you so much for having me on. It's it's a great pleasure, and I appreciate all the information you uh, convey. Your show's really informative, so nice job. We really appreciate it. You, you ever attempt that with a backhoe? I, I was pretty amazed by that person's skills. The, the, you, you know, I've gotten out of the mud with a backhoe a lot of times, but I've never done that. You have had an interesting journey into where you are now. Before we talk about this hammer and all that, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you got into that seat with that uh, yellow shirt on. Yeah, so it's a it, it's an interesting story. I actually started parking cars uh, as a deckhand up on Lake Champlain for the ferry system. And that turned into engineering school and that turned into sailing around the world uh, and working for some of the largest shipping companies in the world. It was a great, great experience um, all, all through it, the traveling part of it uh, mostly. And, you know, we started out on the old boom ships and, and then the container ships. And, uh, and now uh, I came out to the West Coast and worked for a medium-sized shipping company uh, out here on the West Coast. It was in a management position, came off the ships. And uh, it, it, at some point, you know, we, we had some engineering problems. We were looking at emissions, as everyone is in the industry uh, and in the shipping industry. And, and somewhere along the line, I realized that I went to an ACT conference down in Long Beach, and I realized, hey, these these truckers are going to solve the problem. They're 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 ahead of everybody uh, when it comes to solving the emissions riddle. And so I I got a an interest in in trucking and. Uh, Kind of parallel with that, when I moved out to the West Coast, I bought a container back in Norfolk and I had it railed out here. And I found that nobody could 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 move the container to the ground or onto a chassis. Uh, even a big logistics company couldn't find me anyone that would do that. So we'd have to hire cranes and everything. So I kind of became interested in all that. And uh, w when COVID came around and the great resignation in August, I thought of 2021, I said, you know, you know, I'm not getting any younger, so here, here's a good time to to sort of follow my dreams, and that's what I did. And I'm having a great time uh, learning about all the equipment. Uh, I'm in the intermodal drayage uh, area for the most part, and that's what I do. Um, and so we got, you know, we bought a Hammer 110H, uh, which moves containers to the ground, fully loaded. I mean, it can it can handle up to 79,300 pounds, lift it right off the ground and put it on a chassis. Um, it can carry about 33,000 pounds. Mine's kind of heavy um, because it, it has a lot more features and uh, heavier cranes and chassis. But um, yeah, it's it's been really fun. And so I'm out educating the industry on what can be done with, with a hammer. Um, and as you see in the video, there there's, it can stack or unstack too high. It can also stack too deep. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's made in Sweden. I I went out. Uh, they invited me out to tour the factory. Uh, ben Hammer is the uh, uh, inventor of this machine, and uh, he's still there. I believe he's in his 80s. He took us to lunch. Uh, he took us on a tour of the factory floor. Uh, it was just an amazing experience. And when, when you look at one of these hammers, I mean, they're just so well thought out. Uh, they're custom built. Uh, you know, they have a lot of models, but you can customize them for your specific needs. It's 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 just a great a great tool. Did um did he tell you when you were at that dinner why he invented this product? No, he 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 didn't really say that. But I think you know it was in the early container days, and 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 perhaps they came across the same the same issues that I did. You know, getting the container to the ground. Uh, you know, we have a good story. I, I just did this job um, about three weeks ago. It was a small machine shop and, and they needed, uh, they had a container they'd bought and they wanted it shipped out to Florida from California. Uh, and so the, the, the broker called me, the logistics company, and I said, hey, I think it's better instead of sending me to Florida with, with the hammer. I said, let's just get a flatbed and uh, I'll go up uh, to Sacramento and I'll grab the 
the container and put it on the flatbed and you'll get a one way. So they they saved a lot of money, you know, with with the hammer, actually, uh, even though it's a little more costly to run a hammer than it is, you know, a chassis in, in a standard drainage format. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a really useful tool. And we're educating um, the brokers and shippers about what it can do. How does it work? Because I see some straps in there. It looks like a kind of a portable gantry crane. It puts the container on there. But like, what is going on that we see in that video? So what what you really see, there's a, a pair, you know, the pair of cranes, they're identical, uh, one forward and one at the rear of the trailer. And my trailer can can articulate or expand in an accordion fashion. So it can lift 20s. It can lift twin 20s. It can lift a 40 and it can lift a 45. So um, all that you don't see, you kind of see it on that sideways, that's a 40. Uh, and and they, they just kind of reach out. Uh, there's two chain straps that go in the corner castings. I think, I think Ben Hammer invented those special uh, lifting devices as well. Uh, and, and then it, it, it lifts it up in, in two, it has two um, crane movements. Those are the stabilizers you see going out. Then you see the upper crane and the and the lower crane movement there. Um, basically, two hydraulic cylinders. That's all. Uh, drops it onto an adjacent chassis in this one, in and, uh, and then tucks itself away and folds back up, and and the container's ready to go. Are you like the only? Do a lot of drage companies use use these? Are you one of the only ones like using these in in the NorCal area? Uh, I, there are there are four or five of them in the uh, NorCal area that that are in different areas. I think there's maybe four of them here in the Bay Area. Uh, I think there's a few more up in Sacramento. Uh, Hammer knows that better, but yeah, we uh, we all kind of have our area. I can go into the the ocean terminals where a lot of guys don't do the UIIA thing because I do drayage as well. So it kind of, it's a synergy with people that are exporting. You know, I went out to Hollister uh, to an airport and, you know, uh, unloaded container, actually loaded containers for, for export here in the port of Oakland. So that was kind of, we did four containers. So we'd bring one out, drop it on the ground, pick the one up and then run it to, uh, uh, to the port where they were being exported to England. Actually, there were Rolls Rolls Royce engines. So Bill, we, it's everything from A to, A to Z. Bill, we talk about um, we talk about the freight recession so much, but I don't want it to get lost in the narrative that TUs are actually up right now. I mean, they're not as good as 21 or 22, but they're above. I mean, they're not as good as 20 and 21, but they're above 2019 and 2022 are you seeing the results of that like are you seeing the results of a chart where it shows it up actually at the port yes it seems um it seems as though we're the drayage industry and the drayage truckers are in a decent place now you can see the number of uii drayage uh registries uh dropping off so the volume of truckers is dropping and that's also helping uh the rest of us with with the demand and the pricing so I, I was started drayage. My company started last year in March, and I didn't have equipment until uh, last fall to do drayage. But once I finally got into the port and I got all the insurance and, and the registries, um, it was pretty much at its peak, and it's 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 dropped off a little, but not so much. It's been pretty pretty solid, I think. So. Um, there's there's a really great tool out there, Load Match, uh, for for the drayage industry, and you can actually uh, you can look back and see pricing and stuff on different lanes. It's it's kind of, it's very handy for that. So and that's that's how they find me too. They look for Landall and Side Loader, uh, searching through Load Match, and that's how I get calls and and business. Very interesting. You, you know, you mentioned um, you mentioned that when you started out, you were thinking about emissions and EV when you, when you were looking in this project. And there are regulations coming that are going to force you to continue to think about those. What are what are you planning for for CARB and for the uh, deadlines that are coming to the port? What like what's what's happening there? Yeah. So January one, you know. Um, you won't be able to register a, a new truck in uh, in the port. So if you don't have it registered before January 1, 2024, um, you're faced with the dilemma. You have to bring in a, a zero emissions vehicle, whether it be a battery electric or a hydrogen. 
And as I told you, when I was in the, had the marine engineering hat on, which I had on for many, many years, um, I, I saw a company um, uh, at the, at the uh, expo, the ACT Expo, that seemed to be the leader in, in uh, bringing this uh, technology to the market. And I, I have five Nikola trucks on order um, right now. And, and, and we're just kind of waiting for, you know, fuel supplies and, and deliveries, you know, they're in production. So I believe they're in serial production. And I'm, I'm hoping to have, the goal is to have at least one of them before the end of the year. Um, and my two, I have two trucks right now. It's just me. I'm just a single operator right now. But, uh, you know, at some point I'm going to have to hire some more drivers as these trucks start to come online. And my trucks will be grandfathered uh, under CARB to do drayage, uh, but they, they will cap out at 800,000 miles, I believe is the, the regulation. So once you get to 800,000, you have to remove them from the drayage uh, service. Yeah, so you can't, you're grandfathered in, but there's still a sunset on that grandfathering that's tied to the miles. What is harder though? What, you, you said you've been on container ships, you've sailed the world. What's harder, the life of a seaman or the life of a drayman? They're both hard. Being a trucker is a hard job, and and a drayage trucker is a hard is a hard job. I think all truckers, you know, it, it's a it's a hard job, and it's it, you know it can be uh, long hours in uh, difficult conditions, and you have to manage a lot of things. If you own your own independent trucking company, um, there's there's a ton of paperwork. Um, so you know, in addition to uh, the actual physical work. Of driving, um, you have the physical, the 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 mental work, and keeping up with all the paperwork. So, you know, I've been audited twice this year and inspected three times at way stations. So, you know, uh, California Highway Patrol <laughs> is doing its job, and and there's a lot to keep your truck, you know, so you pass those inspections without without uh, any citations. So, Bill, who, yeah, it's it's who, it's hard. Bill, who should uh, who should reach out to you? Who do you want to work with? What 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 kind of partners are you looking for? What kind of customers are you looking for? I'm looking for primarily customers that like to do that need the ground to ground uh, logistics solution. That's that's my main focus, and customers that are going to want zero emissions in everything they do. So when they're moving freight down the road, um, you know you know California has some more reporting regulations coming up for. Uh, emissions for larger corporations. And uh, I want to work for those companies that, that are into that and expand my fleet as we as we go. You know, initially, um, the Nikola trucks, I mean, they're just, I, I've driven both the battery and the fuel cell, and, and they're just beautiful trucks. They, they turn on a dime. I mean, if you're, if you're going to go to a sideshow in California, those things will spin <laughs> Their, their their tires. I mean, they they are have amazing uh, uh, torque. I mean, uh, so so it they're 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 nice trucks. I'm really looking forward to to that. Uh, Don't encourage the people. Uh, I've seen that video online of the the guy who who had the container a few months ago. There was that viral video of the guy who took the container. Or was that the sideshow? He was spinning his truck around. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Not well, a that, idea. The Nikola BEV will 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 spin its spin its tires. Um they had a drive-in event here in the Port of Oakland and and uh I, I got to drive both the trucks, so that was pretty cool. And they they have a lot of pickup. And they're and they turn, they have a really nice turning radius. So, you know, when you're in the in the container stacks in the terminal, you know, some of them are kind of tight. So it's nice to have that nice turning radius. Bill, it was awesome to meet you. We'll have to have you on again soon. Thank you for showing off your hammer. Unfortunately, we're short on time. Can you tell people where they can reach out to you and continue this conversation? Yes, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, coyotecontainer.com. Got my phone number there and uh, some of the things I do. Bill, you have an awesome Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for introducing yourself to us and showing off that, that cool equipment. Yep, same to you. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, if you uh, don't have $61.05, maybe you'll be chased by this turkey. Over here, these were a big problem when I was living in Massachusetts, New England, a ton of them. I think this guy's in, uh, let's see, it says the bird first appeared in the neighborhood in spring and never left after neighbors began to feed him. He's named Smoke. Uh, a driver intervenes to stop the boys. You can see this car comes in and tries to ram, ram the turkey out of the way. It's like, stop it. When I used to work at Freight Plus um, over in uh, Norwell, Massachusetts, they used to they, like, surround in my car. 
once or twice, these turkeys. You can't trust them. The Rack Father says, I want to hear the turkey side of chasing the kid. They think that they might have a claim, though. And then Joel Cranian says, I live in Wisconsin. There are approximately equal numbers of small children as there are large turkeys. But yeah, Wisconsin must be a lot like Massachusetts. Uh, Farley goes, let's go to rate the strap work. We'll skip Let's Who's Coming to Dinner. Take a look at what this guy did with his tarps. Look at that. Not a strap in sight. We have volume. We're giving him a zero. His volume's man. great. Maybe I'll have to play next let, time. <laughs> let's, let's, let's start that tomorrow, though, because I'm not sure that today, today's f***-up's already been penciled in. Yeah. Well, ours, too. Today's F-up on What the Truck has already been penciled in. We're out of time. You can find me on Twitter at Timothy Duner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. You can find the show on YouTube, and you can find the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Take care. Don't be a stranger. We'll be back Wednesday.